some work that I've done um, over the last couple of years, two, near, over two years now, on um, combining mathematical models with observed data and mainly looking at um, internal waves, so solitons um, in, the, in the ocean off WA. Um, and I want to start by just naming my collaborators uh, on this work. So, so from the UWA side, um, there's Ed Cripps and Thomas Stemmler. Um, Ed Cripps is a statistician, Thomas Stemmler is a physicist in the uh, complex systems group. Um, at Cambridge Uni in the UK, there's Mark Shurilami and uh, Femi Chirac, who are the main sort of leaders on this whole statistical finite elements idea and their PhDs and postdocs, Echi, Yeva and Guy. And then in the Alan Turing Institute, um, some collaborators there too, Dennis, Andrew and Jan, who are working on sort of newer um, extensions of the of the work that Mark and um, and us at UWA and the Cambridge team have have laid in our stat FEM work. So so in this talk, um, for those uh, I, I'm assuming a few of you guys have seen um, the stat FEM talks that I gave at the um, at the uh, DSI and Data Centric Engineering Group uh, a couple of weeks ago now, and I want to in this talk. Um, cover the same ground, but a little bit more technical and go over a little bit more of the maths um, and try and clarify some things that were perhaps not uh, mathematically clear in the first talk and uh, provide a bit more of a motivation as to why, um, why we define things the way we do and why we go about um, constructing uh, in particular the prior and the posterior in the way that we do. Um, so I want to start with a bit of more technical discussion on the finite element method and what the finite element method is, then go over the static uh, stat FEM prior construction, then go over combining the prior with data to give a posterior distribution, then look at some results uh, from the Staffordshire Bridge. Actually, I've, I've scrapped this part here because it took a bit too much time, so ignore that for then. Then go on to uh, the time-dependent case, um, then finally ending with some experimental data looking at internal waves known as solitons, and then some discussions and conclusions at the end. Okay, so a starter on, on the finite element method really begins uh, often with the Poisson equation, um, the textbook example of an elliptic PDE. Um, in this case, um, we've got some uh, diffusivity function A in our PDE here. And what it more or less says is the second derivative of U or the Laplacian of U over some complex domain omega, um, which is shown as a box in this. So it's just a square in this example here is forced according to a function F inside of the domain. And then assuming a Dirichlet boundary, so a constant boundary uh, without loss of generality, you can just set this to zero along the boundary. Um, and you get and you get the sort of problem set up that you have here that you have some some dynamics inside of your domain omega and omega can be as complex or as simple as you would like it to be and then you have some boundary conditions on the boundary um, but and for a 2d square you get this sort of thing here this is obviously a continuum model um, without any sort of discretization inside of it and often then you want to try and turn the fem handle to figure out how you can solve this thing uh, using the computer. So to start with, we multiply the Poisson equation with a set of testing functions, which are inside of the Sobolev space uh, that just has first order derivatives and they're set to zero on the boundary. And we integrate the above equation to give the weak form. And the weak form um, is so called because it assumes only first order differentiability in your equation, in your system variable U. And we have end up with this sort of shorthand system then that we have this linear combination of U and V, the bilinear form is equal to F dotted with B uh, in the L2 in a product. And so there's a nice this sort of formulation because it's we only need first order derivatives or first order gradients for it. And then we have this way to solve this. Um, and so what we do then is define a subspace VH uh, as a subset of this testing space such that this testing space is a span of a, just a linear system, oh, sorry, the span of a linear set of functions, phi i, um, and this makes the space uh, finite dimensional. So when we plug in the functions where they're supposed to go, so we drop in a phi j wherever we see a v, we end up with a finite dimensional linear system. And we can solve this using the classic um, finite dimensional linear system methods, like a conjugate gradient method, GM res, if this, 
uh, form here is, is uh, non-symmetric, or you can just use a direct solver or a dense direct solver, whatever you, whatever you need to use. Um, and then for, for the choice of phi, um, then you need to be quite judicious then um, uh, for your computations. So there are a couple of classic examples. Are you can choose uh, the hat functions for phi i so that on non-overlapping domains, you just get a zero in, you just end up with a zero in the integral. Um, but then for overlapping domains or something like that, you can use the uh, so-called spectral basis and then that will give you like a Fourier uh, a spectral Galerkin solution. Um, but then you set up the space in a certain way then allows you to use complex geometries of phi, which is really the power of FEM. Okay, so to construct a finite element space, what we then do is we start with the finite dimensional space and we say, okay, we wanna have this finite element um, and we wanna construct a, a domain uh, of omega or a discretization of our problem domain omega such that we have this sort of finite dimensional uh, version of it, um, which is represented by this triple here. So we start off by a set K, uh, which is a bounded closed set. And all this you can think of is just one of these triangles here. Then PD, which is a set of polynomial basis functions, phi i. And you can think of this as having a, a polynomial over each of the nodes on each of these triangles here. And then the nodal variables, um, and these are just uh, the evaluates of the nodal functions, phi j, and we assume that this gives us a Kronecker delta structure. Um, so we can write out interpolants of this on this mesh in a nice way. So then the next thing we do, um, as you would imagine from this diagram, you then subdivide your omega, so your problem domain up into a set of different triangles such that they don't overlap. And when you join them all up, you get omega or a close enough approximation to it. Um, and typically when you're doing finite element methods, you're gonna choose a triangulation of this domain so that no vertex of any triangle lies in the interior um, of another triangle. And this just means that the nodes match up. So you don't end up with a node over here or a node down here, they all, all the nodes match up. And this is what you classically see in images of FEM simulations as the mesh of the system. Um, and then just some analysis here. If you have HJ as the longest edge in each of your domain, then you can write H as the size of your domain. Then you can write polynomial interpolants for any function F as just being the evaluation of the function plus all the, plus the sum of the basis functions. And then when you're solving uh, a problem with FEM, you, you can show that for certain class of problems like the elliptic one at the start, the exact solution minus your FEM approximation UH, and that UH I'll use over and over again for our FEM approximation. You can bound that above by H squared. So as H uh, shrinks smaller and smaller and smaller, your error goes down with the square of that. And then for a general set of uh, polynomials of order R, then you can have this error shrinking to order R plus one. And you can verify this numerically using um, your favorite FEM library. Um, so that's all well deterministically, but then we want to have a way to then acknowledge that there's some natural uncertainty in these physical models. Um, and the motivation of that is that there is inherent uncertainty in these physical models, because when you solve them and compare them to observed of data, there's always a little bit of mismatch or misspecification, which is what I'm going to sort of banter on about over and over again. Um, and this misspecification may be because we have an uncertain forcing function, an uncertain um, diffusivity constant A, uncertain boundary conditions, and even in the case um, for time dependent problems, you may have an uncertain condition. And therefore, you could argue that it's more natural then that these solutions should instead define a reference measure. Um, over the function space in which you're looking. So if you're thinking that like we did when we solved the Poisson equation, that your, your FEM solution should lie in the function space H1, um, then it seems natural then to define a measure over that space that characterizes how certain we are and what properties this function should have such that upon receipt of data, it, it inherits these properties of the function, but is also able to be updated according to what the data is telling us. So the idea of a reference measure then becomes really important because it really characterizes when we're, when we're dealing with, with uh, defining probability over function spaces, 
that it should have some desirable properties that we want it to have. Um, and we can then define our posterior then as the radon nicotine derivative of uh, the posterior UY against the prior. Um, and so the Gaussian measure mu naught forms the basis for our statistical inference. It forms the basis for our, um, our Bayesian inference in this case. And we're assuming now that our likelihood is just equal to this uh, Gaussian here. So it's just HU where H maps from our FEM or function space into our data space. Uh, and then we have some observed covariance Q. This can usually be, you know, like a, just a diagonal with a noise parameter if we have sort of independent Gaussian noise. Um, or maybe it could be a bit more nuanced when we have some sort of functional mismatch like in a Kennedy O'Hagan setup. Um, but now th this all begs the question then, how can you actually construct this prior um, embedded within FEM simulation methods? Um, and the starter then is to say, okay, we're going to add stochastic forcing onto the right-hand side of the PDE so that our, our PDE is no longer a deterministic object. It sort of defines implicitly um, a measure over the function space that we're looking at for you. Um, and I'm gonna suppose then that Xi is, is normal and it's going to be a Gaussian process. Um, and you can think of Xi obviously like a Gaussian process. Um, if CF then is your covariance operator, then you can define a, a, a representative covariance kernel. So the classic GP squared exponential kernel say that lines up appropriately. And I'll show that in some later slides. But then we're going to take a spectral expansion of U. Um, this time, remember, I'm going to make the sum over infinite dimensions because you can then get a nice projection. Um, and so we end up with this infinite dimensional system here. Um, this infinite dimensional system, though, is not of much use because you can't throw infinitely many things into a computer. Um, and so to solve it, we're then going to project down to a finite dimensional space through truncating the series. Um, and by truncating the series, then we can define this finite dimensional linear system like, we, like you can usually do with FEM. And this then defines the Gaussian law over the system. Um, and it defines the Gaussian law, sorry, over the coefficients of our expansion, which is the most important thing um, as a starter. So what, what it says then is our coefficients of our expansion are distributed according to a mean with a mean that has A inverse B and then this covariance structure here. Okay, so going across first looking into the mean. Um, now, if we got rid of the stochasticity in the PDE here and we just solved it deterministically, the deterministic solution to the PDE would exactly be A inverse B. So what we have now is we're saying, okay, uh, we would expect on average um, that our U according to the PDE that we've given and the stochasticity that we're assuming, it should be very, I should, sorry, have a mean about what the PDE solution is, but then it should also vary according to the action of the PDE operator, according to the acting on the prior covariance. Um, and this is sort of like a physically motivated um, covariance structure that says, according to the PDE that we've got, which is A, you can think about it, and according to the prior covariance that we're assuming, which is G, then our uncertainty should be a combination of both of these things. Now, obviously, this is not a finite element discret discretization, and you can change the basis functions such that they're the phi i's that I showed beforehand for an FEM discretization, and this gives the stat FEM prior conditional measure. Um, and we can define in the exact same notation, which I'm going to reuse throughout this talk, um, this prior here, which is conditioned on the right-hand side, the parameters in the PDE, and then the forcing parameters for xi. And this is just a Gaussian, um, and I'm going to call the mean mu and the covariance cu. Okay, so here's, a, here's an example of what this prior measure actually looks like. So we're going to take um, the diffusivity A just to be equal to one um, and add some stochastic forcing. So it says second derivative of U is equal to one plus stochastic forcing. And our stochastic forcing is going to be a GP with a mean zero and a specified covariance function. And I'm going to set the sigma, uh, sorry, the row on the covariance to 0.1 and the lengths to 0.5. Um, now remember that our uncertainty is characterized by our assumed covariance K theta in combination with the discretized PDE operator. 
And remember that we want our prior to inherit some physically motivated covariance structure. Um, and we can write out the marginal, so we can marginalize over xi uh, in closed form due to linearity, and we get something that looks like the following. Um, so if we have 1D example, this is our normal FEM mean shown in the dark blue line. And then we also get these 95% credible intervals or probability intervals um, given by the covariance, the diagonal of the covariance matrix for a given set of uh, chosen hyperparameters. Okay, so then the next thing we can do is say, okay, well, that's fine, but we can also add on a, uh, a 1D, uh, an example where we both have a stochastic left-hand side and right-hand side. So now I'm gonna say that both Kappa and Xi are Gaussian processes. I'm gonna take Xi exactly as it was before, but now I'm gonna make uh, Kappa, our diffusivity function, uh, accord to a GP, which has a sinusoidal mean and a similar covariance structure, um, I think uh, with a 0.25 length scale and a 0.1 the variance. Um, so it's, it's, it's similar, it has a bit of a smaller length scale. We have these sort of fluctuations about a sinusoidal mean um, that we're assuming. But then the big problem then is that the, the marginal prior, so if we integrate over both Xi and Kappa, we can't get this in closed form. So we need to sample out this uh, and do a Monte Carlo estimate to, get, to understand what this actually looks like. And when you do this, you end up with something like this. So we can sample, these are just five samples of Kappa here. So you see this sinusoidal pattern here. And then if we sample Xi and Kappa jointly and plug them into the PDE and solve it, this is the sort of solutions that we get. Um, now there are some nice things we can look into this um, straight away. And the first uh, is that we have some innate variability due to stochasticity, both in the right-hand side and the left-hand side. And we see that our marginal mean looks something uh, that goes through the middle of all our samples, which is exactly what we would hope. Um, but there's also the nice property then that we have um, that at the boundaries, so zero and one, we've pegged it to be exactly fixed at zero. And we can see that our stat FEM prior measure has inherited this sort of physical specification along with the fact that it should be, it should look like the solution to the PDE. So we've been able to encode both the boundary conditions and the PDE form inside of our prior measure, which sort of will hopefully form the basis of our inference as we go on further in this talk. Um, now there's some, some notes here on, on this general procedure. The first is that the prior conditional measure requires inverting A, so our stiffness matrix many times. Um, so it's quite, it's quite a expensive computational procedure for nonlinear models. Um, this is not available in closed form. Our prior is in general not a Gaussian and we can't write out these equations nicely. So we need to do some empirical methods to figure out what it looks like. And some ongoing work of uh, myself and my collaborators is looking at sampling methods, um, specifically gradient-based sampling methods to characterize this prior conditional measure and integrate over um, kappa. And what we're looking at is the moment is unadjusted Longevin samplers, so unadjusted meeting no metropolis correction, um, looking at just simple gradient flows to see if they can characterize our prior conditional measure. Um, but then, Having got this prior now, so taking a step back and going back to the idea of uh, incorporating data into our process, um, suppose now that we're gonna observe some data which has some Gaussian measurement error. Um, the measurement process could be described if we had full knowledge of the true process, but often it can't. Um, and then our measurement data is going to be a linear combination of the measurement error and the response of this true unknown generating process. Um, and, and note that FEM will be a possibly highly misspecified representation um, if there is a lot of model mismatch between uh, what our FEM model is predicting and what we're assuming in our FEM model um, and versus what the data is actually telling us. Um, and as a starter, I'm going to emphasize this operator H, which is the discrete observation operator, which maps from the domain of our FEM solution UH into the domain of our observed data Y. And really what this does is just swap from the grid in which UH is solved on onto the grid in which Y is observed on. Okay, so then to combine with data, we combine all these different um, ideas into to form the data generating process, the DGP, which I'll refer to it 
from here on in, and it's going to be row uh, h applied to u. Now row is just a scalar scaling um, scaling uh, scalar that will act to sort of make sure that our, our model is predicting things on the right scale in comparison to the, to the data. Um, D is going to be a functional mismatch process, similar to the ideas in uh, Kennedy O'Hagan uh, model mismatch uh, setup. And eta is just going to be some observed noise. Um, this could be from measurement devices or like thermal noise in the system or something like this. And we can infer, we can try to infer it using the marginal likelihood or you can sort of assume that it's known and we know what, what that parameter looks like. Um, and we're gonna denote any of the hyperparameters of D, eta um, and rho up here as W. And this is going to be a set of hyperparameters and we, can, and we can estimate all of these using the marginal likelihood. And finally, statistically, we're assuming that U, D and eta are all independent. Okay, so then we can write out our likelihood. Um, similar to what I was showing on the infinite dimensional slide, this is just a Gaussian with our mean of HU uh, with a specified covariance of KD uh, plus sigma squared I. Um, so noise term and a functional mismatch term. And we can combine this with the prior. So remember we're calling that our prior is given from our PDE, our stat FEM prior measure to give the posterior distribution here. Um, and using the normal Bayesian uh, handle, we can get this and we can write it analytically, assuming that everything is Gaussian. Um, and what's nice about this is that this is a statistically coherent combination, at least in my opinion, of prior physical knowledge, P of U, and observed data, P of Y, given U, that takes into account possible model misspecification um, and then allows for this, uh, this, this, this data to be rigorously incorporated into our inference procedure, taking into account both what we know about the physics and what we know that, about the system that might be possibly misspecified. Um, and it allows for us to write out this posterior over the model solution um, instead of say over the parameters of the model, which is typically what you would get in an inversion type setup. So in my opinion, this is a, this is a step where stat FEM sort of differentiates itself from Bayesian inversion type ideas in that we're not looking for a P of theta given Y, we're looking for a P of U given Y. Um, and we're actually interested in what the state of the system is looking, looking like instead of supposing that our, our mismatch comes in in the parameters. And finally, um, statistically, it's, it's important that we have the marginal likelihood so we can get an estimate of what the parameters W look like. Um, and in my work, I've been, I use uh, marginal likelihood optimization to find out these mismatch hyperparameters. Um, my colleagues in uh, Cambridge have typically been using MCMC and getting the posterior means for their estimate. Um, and I'll show you some, some of their work later on. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of setup that we're working with here. We have a prior, we have a data generating process. We combine the two using the Bayesian, um, using Bayes theorem. And now we wanna look at an example of what, what actually happens when we do this process. Um, so as a starter, we're gonna take the stat FEM prior conditional measure as previous. Um, I'm just gonna change the right hand side to be pi squared on five um, and set xi. Uh, as previous to be a GP with the same squared exponential kernel with these hyperparameters here. And now I'm gonna assume that our data is generated according to another GP um, and add on some measurement noise. Um, and that says that Y is equal to a Gaussian process, which is, has a mean given by the sinusoidal function here, and then has a covariance, which is given by the Green's function applied to our prior assumed covariance, which is this thing here. Um, the Green's function is like the analytical um, or the continuum version instead of the discretized, PD, discretized FEM version of inverting our, our elliptic operator. Um, and recall that we've got data arriving by this process here. And as a starter, we want to estimate the hyperparameters, rho, sigma d, and ld using MCMC. Um, and combine these uh, the data to give our posterior conditioned on these empirical estimates of uh, rho, sigma, and L. And note that this is an empirical Bayes approach. Um, and finally, sorry, we've got N, Y observation locations, and we're gonna observe N, O data sets at these locations. 
Okay, so estimated parameter estimates um, for a varying number of observed data sets for 11 observations are shown here. So a hyperparameter uh, rho, sigma d and ld are all shown here. And what, what this ascent and what the data looks like in this example is we're going to observe 11 different locations, uh, one time, 10 times, 100 times and 1000 times uh, and, and condition on data generated according to that. And so as you observe more data, you end up with uh, less, certain, less uncertainty about your parameter estimates. And we're gonna estimate rho to be about 0.77, um, sigma about 0.08, and then LD at about 0.68. Um, and we're gonna take these uh, posterior mean values from MCMC and just set, set them to be fixed throughout the remainder of uh, this, this example. So then conditioned on these parameter estimates and everything else that we've assumed, uh, we then can update the FEM solution here. So this is the FEM solution UH conditioned on the data Y, given the hyperparameters, given the forcing and given the parameter estimates and given the assumed uh, forcing parameters theta. Um, and this says that we've got a, a posterior Gaussian measure taken for ny equals 33 so 33 observation locations these are given by these sort of column looking things here and then n observations equal to 100 so 100 observed data points at each location and then a thousand on this side at each location and you can see that our prior shown in blue gets shifted according to what the data tells us to give us the red measure uh, below and it also shows that the uncertainty shrinks according to how much data that we have um, in each in each simulation and note also that we're also preserving the boundary conditions again so remember that our prior sort of defined the boundary conditions as fixed here um, and the posterior inherits this sort of fixed property in our boundary conditions and acts as a compromise between what we know a priori and what the data is telling us after we observe it and combine it into our model. Okay, so that was a sort of whirlwind tour of the stat FEM construction in uh, the static case for the Poisson equation. Now to extend the methodology to time dependent and nonlinear systems, what, uh, what my job, this is mainly my work now, is to look at an, a KDV equation with stochastic forcing and see how we can do the same procedure going across time. Um, so the KDV equation um, is given by this thing here and the KDV equation is used to model internal waves. So waves that propagate through and uh, in, in between layers of water density. And an example I'm gonna show is uh, through two layers of water density. Um, and we assume that our uh, spatial uh, spatial correlations on delta are given by the same um, stochastic force, stochastic forcing operator that we assumed before, but we now have this delta correlation in time that essentially means that this is the discretized increments of a Brownian motion process. Um, so it's a functional function valued Wiener process that's spatially regular um, according to the covariance, but in time it's actually delta correlated, so independent increments in time. Okay, so to get, so to then turn the FEM handle again, you multiply it by test functions and you integrate against everything. And you end up with this nonlinear variational problem over here. Um, now, if we discretize then using Crank Nicholson in time, we can write out then that our UH, so our FEM into FEM solution at these discrete time points, N delta T is equal to UHN. And then we put the midpoint between them, so the average value between them um, as u n plus a half. Then we can then we can write this nonlinear evolution um, by u h n plus one minus u h blah 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 into this equation here. Now, after doing some maths and writing things out, um, this this actually defines uh, an evolution, a nonlinear evolution over the FEM coefficients u of h at n. And now this is just a, a vector here. And what it says that u of h uh, at n plus one, u of, and then as a function of u of h n, plus some Gaussian noise is just equal to zero. 
and then we can write the data generating process um, with, and we're going to get rid of the functional uh, mismatch in this example, just to simplify things a little bit. Um, and you can write this thing here. And really what this is defining is just a nonlinear Gaussian state space model. Um, and this means that all the machinery from ensemble Kalman filtering and data assimilation is now available to us for this, uh, for this system here. Um, so, so what it says is we have a nonlinear evolution on our state U of H, we add on some Gaussian, um, some smooth Gaussian error, which is independent at each time. And then we observe after pushing everything through the model, um, the data according to our observation operator plus some stochastic noise. And what we're interested in now is the posterior filtering measure. So what we're interested in, in, in that means that we're after what is the posterior of U of H, so our FEM coefficients, given all the data up to the current time point, conditioned on that data, also conditioned on our FEM, uh, sorry, on our model uh, parameters and also on our assumed forcing parameters in the, in the Gaussian process. Now we can compute this using the standard methods of, um, of data assimilation. And in this talk, I'm gonna focus on the extended Kalman filter um, and calling that EXKF. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then if we write out um, the, the prior measure, the assumed prior measure on the previous time step, and we assume this is Gaussian, then the extended Kalman filter follows. Um, so as a start, what we're going to do is push, ever, push the previous estimate for the mean, mn minus one, through the model and try and solve uh, using a Newton step for this value here. Then we're going to update the covariance matrix. Um, according to this sum here, and where J now is just the Jacobian of our nonlinear model M. Then we're going to do a standard Kalman update using the observation covariance SN here, um, and, and update the mean according to a standard Kalman uh, system here. So we write the mean as this thing here, and the covariance as this update here. And note that this general procedure is exact for the linear models. If we have a linear model, the Jacobian's J just becomes the appropriate um, linear combination of the FEM matrices, like the mass matrix or the stiffness matrix. Um, but for the nonlinear approximation, we have to use the tangent linear, uh, the Jacobian, in order to, um, to get an estimate of the covariance. And these estimates are usually um, have, there's been some work that have shown that these extended Kalman filters, if you have uh, frequent observations in time, they can be a reasonably accurate estimate of your actual covariance, um, even for some nonlinear models. But of course, given that the model is nonlinear, it's, it's never going to be perfect. Um, so a case study that I looked at in my, in my paper was applying the STAT-FEM methodology to the measurements of internal waves, which are uh, solved by the KDV equation, observing data at a thousand time steps at each of these three locations here. So what we have is waves propagating inside of these in turn, in, inside of this tank in this two layer system, where we have the waves as shown, the initial condition is this gray line here, and the waves sort of vary about the mean like that. And we're gonna assume that um, we observe each of these at every single time step in our model and the data looks something like this here. So each of our time points up to 300 seconds, we have this data at wave gauge one, wave gauge two and wave gauge three for the internal wave uh, displacement. So the wave displacement, uh, meaning the, the displacement from the mean value of zero. Um, this is in meters. So it's about, it varies on the order of about two centimeters plus or minus. Okay, and when we incorporate this data into our FEM simulation here, we see that uh, first in figure A, that we're able to correct completely for the difference between the prior model, which is shown in teal, uh, and the data, which is shown in orange, to give this dark blue curve that shows that more or less we're pretty much bang on um, what, the, what, the, what the wave gauge is telling us at the observed data locations. So that's, that's really nice. We have occasional moments here where the sort of dynamics, uh, particularly in this component, completely align. So our, our uncertainty grows, but then as the mismatch comes in, in this component here, and especially in this component here, it sort of whacks down again. And then in B here, 
the really nice thing we're able to do is reconstruct the wave profile inside of the tank, given only three measurements. So we observe measurements at three locations inside of the tank. And given the, the FEM model, so given the KDV equation model that we're using, plus this data, we're able to get this sort of updated version of our system, our U, um, with an uncertainty quantification inside of the tank. You, you can imagine that trying to do this, get these sorts of um, these sorts of curves using like a Gaussian process interpolator or something like that, you would probably miss out on a lot of the nuance that's contained in the in the physics of the problem that we know. So being able to incorporate data in this fashion um, uh, with this physical assumption, a physical prior that we're using is quite powerful and it lets us incorporate um, some dynamics that we otherwise wouldn't get, um, sorry, some 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 features that we otherwise wouldn't get if we were just using say a Gaussian process interpolation. Okay, so just now some conclusions, uh, some conclusions here. So the, the statistical finite element method as I presented it here sort of provides the synthesis of data and finite element method uh, models. And really what we're interested in at the moment is this posterior, the probability of U given the data condition on all the other stuff that we don't know, like hyperparameters, um, FVM coefficients, uh, boundary conditions, initial conditions, all that stuff. Um, the stat FVM methodology has now been developed in a couple case studies um, and has been published in, um, in a couple papers now for the linear case and for my work on the nonlinear extension. Um, most of these have been looking at 1D simple problems, just investigating this methodology. And But now we're sort of getting the second wave of papers looking at more advanced um, applications and more advanced um, and higher dimensional systems. Um, my code is available on GitHub. You can have a look. Um, the Turing Institute also have put out a package to do this whole stat FEM thing inside of FireDrake, which is a standard FEM solver. Um, so if you're interested, please check that out. Um, and finally, some future work that we're looking into. Um, so gradient, so Longevin methods to sample from the prior conditional measure. That's something that we're really interested in at the moment and we'll hopefully um, get that going quite soon. Um, some analysis of nonlinear static problems, analysis of filtering in the function space. To our knowledge, there's not been that much work done on filtering. Um, so Kalman filtering type methods in the function space. And that would be quite a nice application of our, of our methodology. Um, also applications to digital twins, structural monitoring, monitoring um, inversion for stat FEM, and some current work that I'm doing on reaction diffusion systems. So nonlinear chemical oscillators. Um, and then finally, you know, later on, what would be really nice is looking at additional discretizations for fluids problems, um, hyperbolic problems in particular, and conservative, um, and yeah, conservative discretizations. Um, finally, my website and the Cambridge Group website is shown here for those interested in our work and what we're doing. Um, and here are some references. So yeah, that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much for listening.